Well, let's talk about glo uh, global innovation and not national triumphs because we, we these days we associate uh, solar with China. But as you point out in your book, it actually got started in the U.S. and then Germany popularized it before China took over and, and mass manufactured it. Maybe you could just explain how that worked. Yeah, I mean, it starts in science in the 1800s and then the U.S. commercialized it with uh, uh, Bell Laboratory and using it for the... Uh, response to Sputnik and the satellite program. And then in the oil crisis in the 1970s, the U.S. really investing in solar research and development, and even a really initial small-scale market for solar. That all ended in 1981 when Ronald Reagan came into the office and shut down uh, the U.S. solar program. It looks a lot like what the Trump administration is doing in 2025. And I see some of the sim similarities in which the frontier of innovation just went elsewhere. It went to Japan, it went to Germany. Japan took the reins in the 1980s. Germany took the reins in building a market in 2000s with its uh, subsidy law. And then China started selling to Germany and then eventually really started scaling up and massively investing in production of solar. And one interview I did really clarified it to me about how China took the lead from Germany. Germany seemed to have all the advantages. It had a domestic market. It was wealthy. It was willing to subsidize. But China won. And what one German respondee from the solar industry said was that when Germany was thinking in megawatts, the Chinese were thinking in gigawatts. They were much more ambitious. They really saw a big future for solar. There was less caution. There was less concern about overcapacity. That has got to be a defining characteristic of China's rise in general. This ability to grow and this willingness to tolerate too much capacity and just meet use that capacity up within a couple of years of growth. And that's uh, and then China's just been on its way. And so now we've got 85% of solar manufacturing happening in China. And that's a lot of concentration. And we've got some happening in Southeast Asia and Vietnam and Malaysia and a little bit now in India and small amounts in the US and some other places as well, but it's still really dominated uh, by, by China. One of the things that strikes me about this is, is the role that government has played. Uh, I mean, it came out of, you know, in the, uh, you were talking about Sputnik and the Apollo program and all of that, you know, space being, uh, exploration being powered by, uh, by solar. Um, but then the government dropped it and then Germany picks it up and then China comes along and China has an, a very strategic industrial uh, policy. And that seems to have made all the, di all the difference. Yeah, industrial policy has been part of solar's rise all along the way. What the US did in the 70s, the Japanese in the 80s, the Germans in 2000s and the Chinese after 2010. I just, the only other aspect I would look into is the early Chinese period from 2000 until the global financial crisis in 2008 or 9, that was not central government. That was the Wild West. That was entrepreneurs, Chinese students that had trained in Australia, worked with solar there, going back to China and saying, maybe now is the time to do production here, scavenging around the world for used PV production equipment, struggling to raise single digit millions of dollars to start a line and finding very little support until they were able to convince Germans that they could sell panels to them, and until they were able to convince pension funds in the US that Chinese solar was a good investment. And so you had this flow of money from teachers' retirement funds in the US going to China for solar companies. The Chinese were using that money to buy equipment from Austria, from Switzerland, from Italy, from the US, bring it back to China produce solar with that equipment, sell it to Germany, and then to other places like California and Spain after that. And it's really this global innovation system and these flows of knowledge and money moving around the world. But that was not coordinated by the, the Chinese central government. It was only in the, China, in the global financial crisis 2008 or 9 that those companies became at risk, those Chinese companies, because governments around the world were cutting their subsidies, especially in Spain. And so the government stepped in to support Chinese production and eventually created a domestic market. And so since 2010, clearly there's been industrial policy. But before that, it was an entrepreneurial landscape. And there's still part of that today. 
that's that's actually quite fascinating um so the uh the other part of the the solar industry um oh i i know what i wanted to to talk, ask you about and that is Uh, the, the percentage of uh, manufacturing capacity in the solar Chinese solar industry that's actually being used because I I was reading some in a Bloomberg story that only 38 percent of that capacity is is utilized and that gets to your comment earlier uh, about how eventually the Chinese will use 100 percent of it and at that point it's they'll be flooding I guess uh, global markets with with panels. Yeah. And I think the other thing to think about with that is that with that overcapacity, if that situation were happening in Canada or in the U.S., those companies would probably go bankrupt because they're not utilizing their capital fully and they'd be penalized by investors and maybe shut down. Um, but in China, that's not the case because growth is so strong that you can imagine that 38 percent capacity gets used up within a couple of years. And so there's just a little bit more patience, but not a lot. It's just a couple of years. And then you're back up to reasonable amounts of 70, 80 percent uh, of utilization of, of the capacity. So being a little bit ahead has not been a problem for China, but it seems like that is a bit of a problem um, when that's happened in Western economies. And that, that has been a big difference. Uh, you also make the point in the book that the other part of the solar equation is the soft costs, installation and permitting and and so on. Maybe you could address that. Yeah, I mean, it's a big part as the cost of the devices, the, the photovoltaic cells have, have come further and further down. The portion of the installed costs that is cells is also come down. And so the portion that's humans roofers, electricians installing systems on roofs or doing them in a large centralized location, it's become a bigger share of the cost. And we have seen some improvements in learning by doing in terms of how solar gets installed and doing it more efficiently. Um, but that becomes more of the cost as the cost of the hardware has come down. And so one thing I've been doing is looking into the places with the lowest installation costs. And those are not the places that you might guess, I mean, maybe you might guess India because you have low labor costs there, but just with India are Germany and Australia that have the lowest install cost in the world. And there it's not an issue of low cost labor. It's an issue of people knowing what they're doing, doing a lot of it, learning by doing and having strong incentives to install quickly. And there was this program in Australia where people were getting installs in one day. And I I watch the systems getting installed in, in my neighborhood or from my relatives, and it's not a day, it's weeks to get uh, a system connected. And that's a big difference. So we can learn from what's doing well and what Australia has been doing with residential installations is really a model for the rest of the world to see see how they've done it and see how they've been able to do it affordably. So it's it's a real cost, the, the soft cost, but they can be uh, reduced and we have examples of that. I'm wondering what you think about trends like we're seeing in Germany with uh, uh, balcony solar. These panels are are so light and so cheap. Uh, you hang them off your balcony, you plug them into your uh, just into your wall plug, and and you've got you've got electricity. Is is that just a novelty, or is this idea of really simple, easy to use? You know, consumers can do it. There's no installation costs, and is is that um, uh, maybe going to catch on? It's a good question. I don't think it's a novelty. I think it is something that's really deeply part of how solar works because it is modular. It's It functions really well with the existing system. If you have a small system like these balcony solar systems are limited to about four panels so that your electrical wiring can handle just plugging them straight in uh, to, the, to the outlets that you have there. And that's starting to happen in the US as well. But there's this contagion effect that we have where we've seen what in my book, I was tracking about a million systems that have been installed in the last two years in solar in, in uh, Germany for balcony solar. But that number is like three or four million now it just continues to keep going. But because I think it's representative of what's likely to happen in the rest of the world, not that every balcony will have solar on it, but I think a lot will. But just think of the other ways that you could do small scale solar and not have to get approval, not have to get permission to do it. That's part of what makes it so expensive in a North American context to install solar. It's all the planning and permitting. And if you do it small, like balcony systems, you're not going to disrupt 
the electrical grid, um, and you also don't need to to wait for permission to do it. So that really, I think, is there's going to be more and more pressure to do those types of systems in a North American context because, for a variety of reasons, electricity is going to get more scarce in North America, and so having that system available would be more attractive. Uh, my final question actually um, is segues from your your last answer, uh, and that is. Uh, we're seeing the the grid in the U.S. in particular under serious stress uh, and uh, more stress coming in the form of demand from artificial intelligence uh, data centers. And what we're seeing in response by some uh, on the part of, res, uh, you know, homeowners, but also on the part of uh, industry and large commercial operations, which are now self-generating. And so they get solar panels, they get a battery, they get digital controls, and maybe they're part of a microgrid in their industrial park, something like that. And it seems like solar kind of lends itself to that, I need a solution. You know, how can I integrate all of these pieces together around solar for my business? Or maybe it's my home. Uh, yeah. What's your take on that? Absolutely. I think that's likely to happen because it's so reasonable to do it. The solar is now very affordable. The batteries are now very affordable. And as you importantly pointed out, the electrical controls that make it work together and make it work with the loads that you have in your business or community also have gotten sophisticated and can handle the changes that happen when there's clouds and, and night and things that solar gets affected by. So I see that happening more and more. I think the pressures that come with higher prices due to increased demand for electricity, such as with data centers, but also with electric vehicles and heat pumps and other electrification, I think will lead to more demand for self-generation. And the tools are way, way better now than they were in the past. And so I think you'll see quite a bit of that. And maybe data centers lead with it because they they need a lot of electricity, but what they really need is a lot of electricity very quickly. And planning for even a natural gas combined cycle power plant or a, or a nuclear power plant to fuel that. It sounds appealing. It sounds like you can have electricity all the time, but we're talking 2030s for those types of plants. Whereas with solar and batteries, you could do that much more quickly. And I think that'll be attractive to them as well as other businesses.